welcome to another show of this week. A delegation from the United Nations Security Council arrived in South Sudan on Friday, September 2nd. Co-led by the United States Ambassador Samantha Power and Senegal's Ambassador Fodesek, they visited displaced communities at a protection of civilian site in the country's capital, Juba, on Saturday. The delegation from the Council arrived in South Sudan following the recent renewal of the United Nations mission in South Sudan's mandate, which underscores the urgency of the mission's tasks related to protection of civilians and the need for stronger cooperation with the transitional government of national unity. Soon after arrival, Ambassador Samantha Power spoke to journalists at the airport and expressed frustration of the international community. The international community is extremely frustrated uh, with the obstruction of UN peacekeeping operations uh, that has gone on for, for too long. It has been extremely difficult for the UN to do its work here, whether that's the work of being out and about and patrolling on the streets in the hopes of protecting civilians who might be vulnerable, or just the work of having humanitarian access so that you can feed people who are in certain parts of this country at grave risk of famine. The delegation visited a protection of civilian site at the UN compound in Jebel. Their three-day mission was aimed at assessing the current political climate, meet with government and non-governmental officials, and let the people of South Sudan know that they still are committed to ending the violence in the country. At the protection of civilian site, they were received by men, women, and children, most of whom sought shelter at the base following the 2013 crisis and the recent fighting in the capital. Council members listened to women speak about what they have had to endure as they risk sexual abuse in search of food and firewood outside the camp in order to feed their children and families. Because it's our chance to see the human consequences of the failure of political leaders uh, to bring peace back to their country. Th these are the consequences. We met with women who described a huge surge in sexual violence against women who leave the camp in order to try to get firewood, in order to be able to cook the food for their families, for their children. As a mother, I can't imagine that choice, a choice in whether I cook for my kids or whether I risk sexual violence outside the camp. I know I would go and, and take that risk for my children. I think any mother would. Um, we heard desperate appeals for the regional protection force to be deployed quickly. Earlier on Saturday, the delegation met with the country's council of ministers where they discussed how they could strengthen some bodies that have been set up to conduct investigations following the recent violence. We heard from the members of Security Council from various countries very useful comments about uh, the implementation of the agreement and the need for us to move expeditiously uh, so that they can see the us moving, the need for us to create partnership with the UNIMIS and, and that the protection force that is being proposed is there to help us rather than to come and invade the Republic of South Sudan. And based on our own actions and how we plan it together with the UNIMIS, uh, that force could be uh, helpful to us in improving our security situation and uh, giving uh, more life to the people of the Republic of South Sudan. We also addressed the specific issue of the unfortunate events that took place on the 11th in Terrain Hotel, where some uh, criminals and some indisciplined soldiers, um, unfortunately, uh, intervened, uh, interfered with the freedom of some of our aid workers. That is a matter, a matter of uh, higher priority to the uh, United Nations delegation here, and we addressed it. Uh, we, we have a very positive exchange of views on how to conclude uh, uh, the investigations. Um, we touched on child, issues of child soldiers, the issues of POCs and so on, but generally speaking, I want to assure the people of South Sudan that uh, the rumor out there that the UN has come to impose on us and to bring uh, foreign forces to take the freedom of South Sudan is not there. What is being underlined here is partnership between the government of the Republic of South Sudan and the UN as to how to improve security and to prevent conflict in our country. I want to underscore uh, the 
point that was made just there at the end by the minister, which is that part of the reason the, the meeting was useful was we got to debunk uh, as a Security Council some of the myths that have existed about what the Security Council has intended. In my case, I got to debunk uh, some of the propaganda about the United States and our intentions with regard to South Sudan. And I think, I hope, that uh, the minister's view, as he's just articulated, is shared by every other minister in the room, uh, that there is now an understanding that when we talk about sending 4,000 peacekeepers uh, to South Sudan on top of the force that is here, it is with one constituency in mind, and that is the people of South Sudan. It is with an eye to protecting them. It is with an eye to ensuring that they get the humanitarian assistance they need. Some are facing famine-like conditions, as all of you know. And I think there's been a lot of rhetoric uh, out there about what the Regional Protection Force will and will not do. And we got a chance to talk through, uh, in very pragmatic terms, what some of its functions will be. And I hope that we have bridged some of the divides that have existed up to this point. During their visit, they will meet with President Salva Kiir and also travel to Wau. Up next, Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta visits his counterpart, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir. President Uhuru Kenyatta concluded a one-day visit to Juba on Tuesday with words of encouragement for the country's leaders to continue to press on with the implementation of a peace agreement. That was really is to encourage them, to encourage them to ensure that there is peace, to encourage them to ensure that there is stability in South Sudan, which are the key ingredients for the prosperity that we wish for the people of South Sudan. And I believe that that is why they struggle so hard to achieve their independence, not for war, but for them to be able to prosper. So we are here to give encouragement and support. We are here to say and to ask the government to push along the peace agreement and the reforms that were agreed to under that peace agreement and to see how that can be fast-tracked. As a special rapporteur of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, I got to the South Sudan peace process. The Kenyan leader's visit was to demonstrate regional support and ensure the implementation of a peace deal signed in August 2015. And August 5th, 2006, I got communique reiterates that the international community particularly the UN Security Council, has the duty and moral responsibility to act decisively and swiftly in support of IGAD and African Union efforts to bring an end to the suffering inflicted on the people of South Sudan and to facilitate an early and sustainable solution to South Sudan's conflict. After a closed-door meeting with President Salva Kiir, President Kenyatta told reporters that his country was ready to offer moral and material support to South Sudan. We are here to offer any kind of support, moral and material, that we could give to help accelerate this process. President Kenyatta said he was pleased about the developments in the country since recent fighting in July. I'm glad I have seen for myself that uh, after the unfortunate incident that took place a few weeks ago, everything in Juba looks like it is back uh, to normal. There is peace uh, in Juba, which is a very good indication. We have seen a government that is working in harmony. President Key said the visit by the Kenyan leader is testimony to strong regional support. For President Uhuru, To come to Juba as the first head of state to come to, to, to Juba after our crisis, it shows that the regional leadership 
is with us and they are very concerned about the situation in South Sudan. President Uhuru Kenyatta is the first head of his state to visit the country after the fighting in July and comes just days before a visit by the United Nations Security Council. In our next story, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees visits South Sudanese refugees in Uganda. The UN refugee chief, Filippo Grandi, on Monday 29th August, visited South Sudanese refugees in Mumanzi Transit Center in Uganda. While at the transit site, he interacted with the refugee community, including children. 90,000 refugees from South Sudan have recently crossed the border to Uganda since renewed conflict broke out in July between government and rebel forces. During his visit, Grandi urged leaders of South Sudan not to ignore the plight of their people. Peace has to come to South Sudan. The leaders of that young country have to behave responsibly and not continue to ignore the plight of their own people. A South Sudanese refugee, Taban Arikanjilo, who escaped from recent violence in the capital, Juba, narrated why he left the country. I was actually chased and shot almost to, but I sneak. I escaped actually narrowly, and uh, that made me actually to decide actually to run away from that, to save my life actually from, uh, from the trouble that had actually taken place from our place. Uganda, which provides refugees with plots of land, allowing them to build homes, grow food and earn an income, is host to more than 600,000 refugees. About half of these refugees are from South Sudan. Nowhere in the world I have seen, and I've been in many refugee situations, nowhere in the world have I seen people settled with land and with the beginning of shelter in less than two months. Uganda is now hosting the highest number of refugees in its history. In our usual Democracy in Action segment, participants discuss humanitarian issues in Yei. Oh, uh, at the current situation we've seen, we reports of people in the bushes, people already crossed to, to, um, to Uganda. What could you say in terms of humanitarian uh, uh, situation right now? Indeed, uh, uh, there, there, there was a massive kind of uh, exodus. Uh, most people are going to the villages. Uh, some of them uh, who could afford uh, probably might have gone to Uganda uh, to look for uh, better pastures, that is uh, education for their children and then probably issues like health. But, but we believe that as a government, uh, we will not, will, not, uh, will not just uh, look and then fold our hands. We will continue uh, working for uh, the stability of the area so that life returns to normality. So the main issue right now for people are uh, issue of access, humanitarian access. So are you engaging, uh, you continue to engage uh, the executives about, about how to handle, how to, to open the route? We, as the representative of uh, the area, we are not going to relax. Uh, we'll be seeing other relevant uh, authorities in the country to assist us, actually, to support the people in the and, and And I think it was positive. And um, we are going to do it. You, so, you, you will hear it in, in the few weeks that uh, the representative of EA actually will be continuing meeting the relevant authorities, be it to, to have the access or be it delivery of uh, medicine so that we don't lose like these uh, 100 children in Lanya because these, these, are, these are the leaders of tomorrow. From your own uh, finding, what are the causes of really this instability that has been experienced there in Ye? The causes of uh, the instability, I cannot be exact, 
But what I can maybe cite is that uh, people are traumatized from the long years of, of war in our country. And as such, uh, if you approach any South Sudanese, even, even in Juba, live alone in Yei, if you if you are driving uh, on the streets of, of Juba, sometimes you will, you, will, you will see that people are, are very aggressive. So people are traumatized. But what we as members, members of parliament should actually do is to open a, a kind of avenues of, of dialogue. People must, must, must dialogue. We should see ourselves as South Sudanese. Uh, if somebody actually is going astray, we need not to use maximum force. We need to we need to hear from him. What is brother? What is uh, my sister? What is your problem? If we hear that one, then we can be able to have a kind of what a kind of uh, a society where uh, members coexist. To to wind up this discussion, as we stop, uh, we're speaking right now. Just briefly, what is the way forward? The way forward, in what word, is that we need to dialogue among ourselves, South Sudanese. We need to love ourselves as South Sudanese and we have to have a common agenda of a country. We have come to the end of our show and we will leave you with our voices of peace. Join us again next week for more weekly updates. Goodbye for now. We need to have a life that will enjoy all of us together as a community. You know, it's our country, a very beautiful country. We need to enjoy it. Please, let's put aside our differences and let's live together as one people. We need a wake-up point. We need an awakening. You know, what is it that we want as South Sudanese? What is it that... Like, what is South Sudan 50 years from now, you know? And I think this is... For, for somebody who, can, who, who is able to think outside the box, I think this is what we should start working on. Enough is enough to the war. We need to stop this war. So we should, we should have that love for our country and you know, sense of patriotism. So let's stop the war.